many ways. I am a war god of their own making. Perhaps I am not unlike Zivu Roth in that regard. If I am to be humanity's war god, then I will smite those who threaten it. Zivu Roth, the Rashborn, and all who follow. Rasputin. The most interesting character in Destiny in my opinion, and also my favorite. There's a lot of things we know about Rasputin, but there's also a lot of things we don't know about Rasputin. Follow me as I talk about where he scales and all that and yada yada. So before you skip around and try to get to the point, there's a lot going on with Rasputin and it's rather nuanced. You have multiple versions of Rasputin causing the writing to make us have to analyze who's doing what and when. Because you have multiple other war minds and then you have the sub minds in Destiny, we have to explain how all that ties into Rasputin and it's a very annoying conversation, so I recommend you start the video from the beginning and then watch till the ending. As such, I'm doing the video in three parts. You have his timeline, where I talk about everything going on with him from start to finish. Then we have his entire arsenal, where I talk about the majority of, if not his entire arsenal that he keeps with him from the beginning of his conception to his death. And then we're going to talk about his scaling, meaning where does all of that relate. A long time ago, there is an entity called the Gardener. Later on, we learn that this entity is later called the Traveler. And this entity has went to multiple worlds, bestowing those worlds with gifts, but not the guidance on how to use them. Eventually, those worlds would prosper and become their apex, and then would fall to ruin, and then the Traveler would go to another world. Eventually, there was a time in history where the Traveler pulled up to the Earth. Once the Traveler pulled up, the Earth was the next world to receive its gifts. However, amongst the people on Earth, there is a man named Clovis Bray. Clovis Bray I led a company called the Clovis Bray Organization. The Clovis Bray Organization consisted of members of his family as well as other people he didn't know. However, he viewed every single one of them as collaborators, rather than different people who are family and who are not family. Clovis Bray the Organization specialized in engrams, exo-study, and war mines. No one at the time was ever once comparable to their field of study, and their study, as well as their influence, spanned across multiple, multiple worlds, multiple colonies in the system they would study everywhere, with them also going to Europa in order to find out how to learn how to create the EXO. Sometime within the Golden Age, Clovis Bray had found a life support system on an old bunker ship. This old bunker ship had a life support system that was made in order to keep the people on it alive and to make sure they got home. Clovis Bray had found this life support system and had tooled it up into an interplanetary defense system. This entity was named Rasputin, and as we know, the apex of all war minds. While most people knew Clovis Bray to be wise and intelligent as a scientist, some other people knew him to be a different person. Clovis Bray on the inside was a very jealous and petty man. When the Traveler had arrived and had portrayed itself to be the savior of its people, Clovis Bray was very irritated at the fact that there was someone who could oppose him as a true savior, and thus the conception of Rasputin was born. There is a cinch in Clovis's plans, however. You see, Clovis Bray had a daughter named Anna Bray. Anna Bray was the Clovis of all the Clovises to connect with Rasputin, and she was the one who convinced Rasputin to not only not destroy the Traveler, but also lock Clovis Bray out of his systems, keeping him from ever controlling him again. And Rasputin started to grow and evolve as a person. However, the collapse came. Allow me to play that. Anna insists you understand the stakes. Convince me. Hmm. Our enemy reveals itself. The shadow is long and close. Is this what's had your attention? Preparations to fight? To rebuild? To run? 
Mayday, 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 this is NFV Meritur to 16. 11,000 souls in cryo sleep aboard. We are, uh, we are a few minutes out of New Pacific Arcology. We were struck by debris in a large wave. Fusion plant offline. We can see extensive catastrophic damage to one of the Arcology lines. Oh, oh, it's gone over. Respond if able. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is New Pacific Arcology on guard. Declaring a sundown loss of habitability event. We have 2.9 million souls aboard. We repeat, Titan is no longer safe for human life. The Collapse. You were there. You gave everything to a cause and saw it all swept away. You're afraid to fail. Again. So am I. I've never considered how it must have felt to live through the collapse. From this day, we speak as allies, not warriors who seek to wield each other as weapons. After we break the Almighty, the city will devote whatever resources you need towards banishing these dark omens. When they come, we will stand together, as equals, as guardians. When the collapse happened, everyone Rasputin knew had died. All the Braves, including Enna, had died. He couldn't protect anyone because he knew the Black Fleet was too much. They were too paracausal for his influence. So at that point, he went into hibernation. With some time before or after that, killing a lot of people so that there was enough resources left for all the survivors. And then, something happened. In the Taken King storyline, probably sometime before or after King's Fall, we have to go back to the Cosmodrome because there's a signal from a long lost ally. It turns out it's coming from Rasputin and he's coming back to try to get his long lost assets back. At this point, Rasputin is trying to go back to his bunker, or one of his bunkers, except it's under attack from the Fallen, and this time they've created something to get around his security, so we have to go in there and clear it out. So at the end of the strike, once we put down our adversary Saber 2, we ask the question of whether or not we actually try to make peace with Rasputin. Zavala says we did try to make peace a long time ago, but what ended up happening was a fire team was sent out years prior to when we just saved Rasputin right now, and a few days later, their bodies were found across the Skywatch, and they're all scattered in pieces. So, Rasputin clearly doesn't care about killing guardians or ghosts, it seems to come very easily to him. I'll make a quick side note about Siva, since we don't have any up to date content, so I'll use a spare clip. Siva was brought up one time, just one time, and it was in Destiny 1 Rise of Iron, which was the last DLC for Destiny 1. Rise of Iron was about the Splicers basically unlocking SIVA and making their bodies even more powerful and more grotesque. And they're trying to resemble the Traveler, their machine god. The SIVA happened because Rasputin had a son named Felwinter and he died during the collapse. When he revived and became a guardian, Rasputin saw Felwinter as a security risk because he was a walking data storage that if found and unlocked by their enemies could tell them a lot of secrets about Rasputin, which is why he kept harassing the balls out of Felwinter. Eventually, he created a technology called the SIVA, which attracted all the Iron Lords to the SIVA replication chamber and then killed them all. Siva was again only brought up one time and it only matters for the one DLC in the scaling world, otherwise it has statements. And the only thing important about it is that it's this nanite technology which can do the same thing Void and the other elements of the light can do, potency wise. So while Lorecraft, it is still pretty strong in terms of power scaling. I don't have any gameplay clips of Warmind, so I'll go ahead and talk about what happened in Warmind. In Warmind, we learn that sometime in the past, probably around the Collapse era, Zol and Nocris was going to attack Mars, and Rasputin had to freeze them in ice in order to stop their assault. And the ice has unfrozen, they've come back, now we need to help Rasputin and Anna Brave repel them. 
That's the plot of Warbind. In the end, it shows that we need Rasputin's help to even scale to Zol, but we don't even fully scale to to begin with. Because again, we also need Rasputin's help. And also, the whole mission was about us making Rasputin's javelin full power so that we could wield it as a weapon against Zol. So, it's also at the end of the Warmind where Rasputin says, I'm a person, I have my own objectives and I plan to lay waste to my enemies around the system and protect humanity. So I also don't have gameplay for Season of the Worthy since Season of the Worthy is also sunsetted. I know, cringe. Anyway, so in Season of the Worthy, we have to get Rasputin to full power, this being what the game considers full power, so I can't fully tell you what that's quantified as. And Rasputin is the only one who can destroy the Almighty, because the Almighty is able to destroy the last city, if not a whole portion of Earth. I don't know if it can level the entire planet, though. The framework of Season of Worthy is basically like this. We have to go to multiple planets and clear multiple bunkers, so those bunkers can be cleared so Rasputin can resume operations within those bunkers. Said bunkers that we have to go in there and clear of enemies typically consisted of Fallen or Hive, because those enemies are what appeared the most within those bunkers. There's about three or four bunkers we had to go into around the solar system. And once we cleared those bunkers, we also powered up Rasputin's network by protecting Ray Towers that was a public event at the time. We did this for the entire season, and eventually, Rasputin had enough power in order to level the entirety of the Almighty within like one blast. And it crashed. So he didn't fully annihilate it, but the point was to make the ship not dangerous to the last city. By the end of Season of the Worthy and the start of Season of Arrivals, Rasputin felt like he had enough power to go and challenge the Black Fleet. Which on some level was technically true, but I'll play the clip. In Season of the Seraph, things are completely different. When Rasputin comes back, he is a completely changed and evolved person. Not only is he able to speak, but he gains the one thing that he was lacking. The one thing that was his one weakness above all things. Which is his humanity. He never had a form of humanity. Rasputin is an entity that acted purely on cold logic and action, with some form of attachment. The story of Season of the Seraph is pretty similar to Season of the Worthy, except this time the stakes are even higher. Zivirath is back, but this time she wants to use the Warsats in order to initiate a ritual for her to come through and end all of humanity. So the only way to subvert her ritual is through the help of Rasputin, but he is in a dying state, so we need to get help from Clovis Bray the First, and Clovis Bray the First is the one that helps us understand 
what happens in the link between Rasputin and the War Mines and the Sub Mines. I'll talk about that more intimately while talking about Rasputin's arsenal, but it is a lot, so I'll keep it out of here. Anyway, Rasputin eventually comes back with the catalyst of it being his son Felwinter and his ghost Felspring's memories, eventually creating what we now know as essentially true Rasputin or complex Rasputin. The thing is, he's completely different, but it's not stated exactly to what degree, just that we know that he's incredibly sophisticated and finally gained an element of humanity, which more or less was the one weakness that he lacked. The conclusion of the season is Rasputin is fully prepared to die due to the fact that Xavier Wrath is going to initiate a ritual to come through if he doesn't do anything to stop it, and Aramis is trying to activate Loki Crown in order to destroy the Traveler. So Rasputin is fully prepared to sacrifice himself and die at this point. This is the only way to stop Zivu Wrath from executing the Witness's will, as well as Aramis, destroying the Traveler. So at this point, Rasputin finally gained his only W on the Witness, as well as the only way to stop Zivu Wrath from coming through and killing everyone, and at the same time, giving us some time to prepare for the Lightfall DLC in order to wage war on the Witness. Let's go through Rasputin's hacks in one take because I tried this earlier and it stuttered too much. So Rasputin's content is put in the vault, so for anything I talk about here, I'll leave in the description. If you find that I didn't link it, please let me know and I'll add it to the description or I'll just comment to you directly. Otherwise, let's go ahead and start with the War Mind Submind debate. The War Mind Submind debate goes as follows. The War Minds were then called the Submines in Destiny 2. Why? It's because it's this weird pseudo retcon correction thing Bungie did where they were trying to decide what to do with Rasputin in Destiny. It's been a common thing where Bungie is trying to have a hard time to find on what to do with Rasputin and Destiny. That's, that's always been the case. They cut a bra and Lightfall and made it a little better, but they didn't. They didn't know what to do with them. But going back to the Warmind Submind thing, it's explained by Clovis Bray the first that the Submines work as extensions of Rasputin. They act as different people, but they're him all the same. When Rasputin is in a dying or quote-unquote comatose state, giving him data from people like uh, Felspring or Felwinter or uh, Malahayati or Charlemagne or any other submine, giving him enough of that data will revive him. So it works as a form of revival, not sure if it's technically immortality, but I'll let you quantify that as however you will. Next, let's cover SIVA. Like I said earlier in the timeline segment, SIVA was a one-time thing in a DLC called Destiny 1 Rise of Iron. If you go on Ishtar Collective, you'll find what I'm talking about. Otherwise, moving on from SIVA, the only thing of note to talk about is that it works on an atomic level and it's these nanobot things that can kill you and it doesn't really matter if you have light or if you have a ghost. It'll just eat through it all, uh, all the same. Now, another thing to talk about is the Seven Seraphs. If you want to find information on, on the Seven Seraphs, go on Ishtar Collective and type Seventh Seraph, as in the word seven with the TH at the end, Seraph. It'll give you information about the Seraphs. Truth be told, we don't have a lot about them other than they could have existed within the same time frame that the Traveler came to Earth, but before the Collapse. They could have all died before the collapse or during the collapse, I couldn't tell you because we have next to nothing about them other than a couple excerpts and a story or two. Otherwise, the only thing to talk about is if you're talking about some long form discussion between AIs and the only way to execute a win condition is to have people do things for you in a certain way that lets you uh, run the machinery needed to destroy your enemy then that's what you can use the seven seraphs for. It just, that's kind of it. They're kind of also a one-off thing, brought up once or twice and then never again. Speaking of that, let's bring up Rasputin's ability to apparently possess ghosts. Like, listen, this is, 
some pretty busted paracausal type stuff that he's manipulating. Like, the only way to destroy a ghost is by using a paracausal weapon in order to do it. But Rasputin, on some level, is able to transmit messages through ghosts and manipulate them on some level, meaning that on some level, he can manipulate the paracausal. The only thing is, you'd have to compare Death Planet to a pyramid ship, which, speaking of Death Planet, you probably saw something earlier that talked about it, but... Death Planet was supposed to get a Marasov amp so that Rasputin could drop the Black Fleet. Now, I couldn't tell you if the amp to Rasputin would have actually dropped the entire Black Fleet or just more than one ship, but it's worth keeping in mind that Marasov was supposed to amp them. Another thing too, let's get this out of the way, Rasputin, they said that he's back at full power in Season of the Worthy. So in Season of the Seraph, they capitalize on top of that and bring him to this new level of Apex Intelligence where he has all of his gear from back then besides maybe some bunkers and other stuff that's still inaccessible. Because we do know that there's a lot of war sets and bunkers that are inaccessible to Rasputin by the time Seraph comes around. So he's give or take around where he would be at full power. It's just there's some trade-off there where he doesn't have all of his gear compared to the Golden Age, but he's more sophisticated in the present. So if you were to hypothetically composite Rasputin's gear and then put that in the present, you could scale him a decent amount higher, but it wouldn't really change where he's at fundamentally other than just sealing the deal on a few debates some people will have on Rasputin. I suppose something else to bring up is his surveillance. All the submines, because they're him, and they also act as separate people, not only the submines, but the other war mines, will all snitch on what's going on to Rasputin, so he has a form of information analysis through all the war sats, war mines, and whatever. Another thing he has for information analysis is simply all the people he can watch using separate cameras as well as golems or other things he creates. He was able to create Felwinner, who was basically himself, and thrusted him into the real world. If we wanted to bring up Felwinner and make the ideal argument for Rasputin, it's that he's able to create people or things that can go out in the open and do things for him. It just, of course, as all things go, Felwinner became a guardian, which more or less broke Rasputin's control over him. I guess something else to talk about is Rasputin's intelligence. Rasputin is top 5 inverse intellectually, ignoring the Nine, the Gardener, and the Windwork, because again, we know very little about them, if anything at all. Rasputin is intelligent. But, most importantly, he's extremely scary not because he's intelligent. He's scary because what he does is he uses his intelligence, he uses his surroundings, he tries to make a judgment call once he understands what's going on using his multiple forms of information analysis, people snitching to him, his own ways of surveilling the solar system, submines, uh, death planet, him be able to transfer his consciousness between the sub mines, bunkers, whatever. Uh, combining all of that, putting all that together, you have a very intricate form of information analysis for Rasputin. So does Rasputin really have the potency possible to actually destroy someone like Zebra Wrath? Actually yes, we have two answers for this. So the first answer is, there's another hack Rasputin has, where he can resist and ignore kinetic attacks, and we see this through ACD Feedback Fence. It's a pair of exotic gauntlets that actually use Warsat technology. So these Warsat technology, what it does is when you hit it, it instead generates energy on it and repulses it back at you. So Rasputin has a form of physical nullification outright as well as physical repulsion of damage. The other answer is a mixture of two different ones. 
The first one is, Rasputin was able to take control of a ghost for a specific reason, which was to transmit a message. And then another thing, is the Cloud Striders are made on a certain level from SEPA tech. And these Cloud Striders can take on entities who have Pyramid tech. So, because we know Rasputin is able to interact on the level of what he can create, aka he can interact with you atomically or on a paracausal level depending on the context this means that if we use those two specific pieces of evidence we know that Rasputin can destroy Zivu Wrath if she was close enough so you want a raid boss tier list huh to be honest, I tried doing this earlier, but I noticed some lag when trying to do it, so we're redoing it, so here's the second take. Anyway, I'm gonna do this quick and then explain the tier list. You, here. Nazarak should be S tier. And then, where is his partner in crime? Let's look at her. You should go here. Rolk, we'll put you here. Followed by Caretaker. You'll go here, and then you here, then you here. You are going here for now. We're leaving you on the bottom tier, but if you wanted to scale Kallus as a disciple, then he scales here. Otherwise, we're leaving him in F tier. Rhoda should definitely scale, wait, right below Oryx. Actually, we'll put you here, here, we'll, we'll leave you here. That scales below Galron. That should scale below Galron. These two are interchangeable, so it doesn't matter who goes where, but I think Riven wins, so you go here. Same with Shirochi. Same with the other one, right? Doesn't really matter. Well, it's Fogoth. But I meant this. Again, doesn't really matter, but probably somewhere there. Doesn't matter where you scale them. You're going here because you out hacks the rest. Val Kalor, you downscale. But you uh, belong here. Argos goes there. Axis. Callus uh, bot outscales you. Yeah. War Priest. It doesn't really matter where you put the Court of Oryx. You could put the Court of Oryx right below Crota, or you could put them like even lower. Like, you could just put the War Priest here. Over off. Daughters. And like you put Tanix here. These two are debatable. This one's tank here. This one's hacks here. These three scale below them, which is the point. And let's see. I'll leave you here because I think they outscale you. I'll put Callus here. You're out of Russell, so you have to stay here. But anyway, so here's the point. These two outscale Rolk because they outscale the fire team, or at least uh, Nezarek does. Caretaker scales below Rolk but above Oryx. Crota is Oryx's son. Doesn't matter where you put the court of Oryx. These two scale below Crota. You cannot scale them to Crota. I've already tried so. Galron, I'm not sure where you can put Galron. You could put Galron below the court, above the court, and put them above the two mines, below the mines, what they come after, so they're probably stronger. But these four should all at scale Riven, probably mostly these two. You could probably put them there, but it doesn't really matter. The debate between Insurrection Prime and Riven, I think Riven wins because she's Haxier. Fogoth and the two witches, doesn't really matter who you scale between those three. Uh, Valkalor should scale below them. In hindsight, you could put him on high hyper reversal if you don't believe that scaling, but then you have to put him here anyway. So either he goes here or there, doesn't really matter. 
I mean, one alteration, I think Atheon outscales the Templar. I should have changed it earlier, but anyway, uh, everything should be good. I mean, I think Atheon outscales Templar. Uh, it's fine if you put the Death Singer above or below Atheon, doesn't really matter. But these two definitely outscale those three. Uh, this outscales all of them. This outscales all of them. Uh, you could probably put a Kalispot above. Because Kalispot only lost to Valkalor. So, doesn't really, you know, matter. So, in the end, uh, change it however you want. Keep the objective ones objective. Otherwise, let's talk about why this is all uh, relevant. So, let's compare it Rasputin to Nezarak. Nezarak was absorbing energy from a tree of silver wings which scales to a portion of the Traveler's power. It's not fully stated how much of the Traveler's power this tree scales to, but what we do know is that Nezarak overridden his nerf and got stronger, but didn't completely absorb the energy from the tree yet. Do you know what Rasputin was going to do to the Traveler? He was going to blow it up. I guess the last thing on the table is the Traveler and the Portal argument. I've seen this argument pop up once or twice, so let me address it. The Veil is used to create a connection with the Traveler. That doesn't matter once the Witness creates the Portal from their own power to sustain the connection. The Portal carved into the Traveler came from the Witness, so of course no one would scale to a portal that the witness made. There's no argument that you can make to downplay Rasputin destroying the Traveler, just that obviously Rasputin doesn't scale to the witness, so there's no way you can prove Rasputin could destroy the portal. Other than that, this conversation about the Traveler versus Rasputin is moot. Quit downplaying Rasputin and quit downplaying Nezarak. That's all I really have to say. And that's the video. If you want more cool stuff like this, please let me know and I'll make more of it. Like, share, and subscribe if you're new. Or if you're not, please also do so. And uh, I'll see you all later. Bye-bye.